uh, as Rachel said, I'm, uh, I'm a professor of urology and, and health policy uh, here at NYU. Uh, and I'm very interested uh, in the in clinical management of prostate cancer and and prostate cancer surgery. I did my training at, at Johns Hopkins with Patrick Walsh, as did our chairman uh, Herb Lepore. Um, but I'm also interested in public health and uh, and the impact that a lot of our treatments and screening paradigms have on uh, on prostate cancer prevalence and how well we're doing treating prostate cancer. Um, I put together a talk that I'm worried may be slightly too technical. Uh, but I know that there's probably a lot of very sophisticated uh, uh, folks in, in the uh, audience who, who will get it. But I'll sort of decide how quickly or slowly to move along based on how many quizzical looks we get. So uh, if, if you guys really are, are scratching your heads, I'll, I hope I'll be able to, to slow down and make sure that, that we get it, uh, get it all. I'd like to really sort of, uh, in, in the screening talk, at least make sure that some central points about PSA come out. Because uh, PSA, uh, if you read the New York Times, you might think that it's a four-letter word. Uh, but indeed, uh, there's a lot of good things about PSA, uh, uh, and, and there's, we certainly need to understand it because it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a part of the firmament right now and, and uh, uh, definitely affects the way we think about prostate cancer. So uh, I have some points that I'd like to get to, um, and we'll go through them. We may skip the other biomarkers part. Um, but we'll definitely address the flaws in PSA and what those biomarkers might, might be trying to add uh, and then try to summarize as into uh, what might be the best way to screen for prostate cancer, at least in, in my own humble opinion. So why screen for prostate cancer? Um, when we look at prostate cancer incidents across different ages, uh, we see that it's, it's uh, probably not all that pre prevalent in 30-year-olds. Uh, 30 but when we get to patient, when we get to folks who are men who are aged 70 to 79 year olds, prostate cancer is incredibly common. Uh, uh, 60, th these are from autopsy series, but, uh, but uh, almost two-thirds of patient, uh, of men, of all men, have prostate cancer. And there's, there's sort of an old adage that more men die of, uh, die with prostate cancer than die of prostate cancer. That's certainly true, but that to some extent minimizes the, the true impact of prostate cancer in that it is a lethal disease. What is the grade? Is that grades? That's all grades. Any prostate cancer, any Gleason score at all. So you step section the gland, uh, you know, most of them will be Gleason sixes, but this is everything. Uh, so um, uh, the, the numbers are basically like this. If you look at autopsy series, about two thirds of men will have prostate cancer. If you look at the, your lifetime risk of ever being diagnosed with prostate cancer, it drops way down to 15%. And if you drop down, and, and then it drops down once more if you look at how many men actually die of prostate cancer. And that's your lifetime risk of dying of prostate cancer uh, is about 2%. So, so there are more men dying with it uh, than of it, but it's still a, a, an, it's still a, a, a lethal disease. Uh, it is the most common cancer in U.S. men. We expect over 200,000 new cases diagnosed. Uh, and there's the lifetime incidence numbers, as I was saying. And it's, it ranks second as a cause of cancer deaths among men after lung cancer. So 30,000 deaths a year is really nothing to sneeze at. It is a very important uh, uh, killer uh, of men. And if you look at it like this, sort of in terms of other important public health problems, yeah, you look at it, uh, you know, heart disease is very, very common, lung cancer, stroke, COPD, pneumonia, and prostate cancer is down at the bottom of the list. So you could look at this and say, oh, you know, prostate cancer isn't really all that important compared to all these other things. And to some extent, that has some merit. But I would argue that if you're not a smoker, and if you take relatively good care of yourself, then some of these other things aren't, you're not as likely to get some of these other things. And you're more likely to get a diagnosis of something like prostate cancer because you'll live long enough to get it. Uh, so it becomes, a, it becomes a more and more important problem if you view it in, in, that, sort of, uh, in that sort of light. So what is PSA? PSA is a protein that's made by prostate epithelial cells. Uh, both normal prostate cells and cancerous cells produce PSA within the gland. Uh, whenever those cells are somehow disrupted, uh, they release PSA into the blood where we can detect it with serum tests. 
So PSA is not specific for prostate cancer, but it's a, it's a marker for the breakdown of prostate cells. Other things cause increased PSA, things like just a simple aging, uh, uh, enlarging of the prostate, BPH, we call that. Uh, prostatitis, so infections of the prostate or infections of the urinary tract in men, uh, as well as prostate cancer. So the, the PSA test has been widely used since 1987, since some of the early studies established it as a, as a good marker for, for prostate cancer. And we know that there's some normal variation within a, within a person who doesn't have prostate cancer. That, that number can bounce around, ba basically plus or minus uh, uh, 0.5 nanograms per ml per year. And that's using the same assay. Sometimes those changes can be greater if you're using a different lab. So how did PSA become so popular? How did it become part of the established uh, you know, armamentarium that, that physicians use? Uh, basically, before PSA, uh, we were flying a little bit blind. Um, we had digital rectal exam uh, and uh, a marker called prostatic, uh, 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 prostatic alkaline phosphatase and uh, transrectal ultrasound to screen, diagnose, and stage prostate cancer. Um, but uh, these weren't very good. Digital rectal exam has a very low rate of detecting prostate cancer, uh, about 1 to 2 percent when it's used on its own. And men who actually have positive exams, so where you can actually feel the tumor, uh, by the time you can feel the tumor, the, the horse may be sort of out of the barn. It may be too late. So PSA was, was a giant leap in prostate cancer care. Uh, there, there were sort of three important studies that uh, that that established it, uh, Stamey et al. in the New England Journal uh, originally described it and, and described its superiority over uh, PAP. Uh, Bill Cooner said that PSA was better than DRE or transrectal ultrasound alone. And then Bill Catalona had a, a, an incredibly important study where he determined the characteristics of PSA in a community of self-referred volunteers. And he established that threshold of four. Um, the, but the discovery of PSA, what it, what it signified in, in real terms, uh, was, was, it, was uh, it allowed prostate cancer to be diagnosed while it was still curable. And it also, it, what it is really good at, and I don't think anyone really disputes this, uh, is it allows us to, to monitor treatment success. So say after the prostate is out, if the, pros, if the PSA goes to zero, we know there's no prostate cancer, and, and we, can, we can use it in that setting very well. So the widespread use of, P of PSA uh, created something called the PSA effect, also called stage migration. It essentially changed the epidemiology of prostate cancer in the United States and other nations that screened for prostate cancer. So if you look at incidence, incidence is the number of new cases per year for prostate cancer. We see that it was sort of puttering along here until PSA came along in the late 80s. Then there came a sharp spike in the incidence of prostate cancer. Not really anything to do with the biology of the disease. This is called the Cull effect. When you have a great new test, all of a sudden you find all of the subclinical cases that were out there. So all of a sudden we, we found all these cases, uh, uh, and, uh, and once we found them, it settled back down to a lower level, still higher than the initial level because we're still finding uh, new cases. We're, we're much more sensitive in our diagnosis of prostate cancer, uh, but it came down from that, from that peak. Patients started getting diagnosed at a younger age. So whereas before PSA or in the early PSA era, it was 68, now men are getting diagnosed in their early 60s. This could be because we're diagnosing the disease at a more curable time, or it could just be lead time bias is, is a lot of the criticism of PSA. But, but nobody would argue that PSA, that pr prostate cancer now is diagnosed uh, in younger patients. Men are tend to be diagnosed with lower stage disease, which makes sense because now we're fine. Now most men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer, you can't feel the tumors, uh, whereas before that was the only way that we can find them. So, so not, not much argument that it's lower stage disease. This T1C, this stage, is, uh, it means that you can't feel the tumor and it's only because of elevated PSA. It's this orange bar. Again, before PSA, it was non-existent because there's no real way to find prostate cancer unless uh, um, uh, 
there's no way to find it with a serum test. And once we had the test, this rose. And then uh, all, the, all the other advanced stages of prostate cancer fell at the same time. And patients are living longer with prostate cancer. So where the age of diagnosis, we see it falling, their age of death from all causes is starting to go up. But the question, you know, the central question is, is this real? Is, is this because we're curing prostate cancer? Or is it just because we're labeling men earlier in the course of the disease, so they're living longer with prostate cancer, getting diagnosed at a younger age, uh, but, but it being diagnosed at an earlier stage, but then they're sort of doomed to whatever their fate was before anyway? I'd like to argue that it is real. This is, uh, this is a little bit controversial, but, but I think most people, most people believe, believe these hard numbers. So this is the annual age-adjusted cancer death rate among men for, for various cancers. We see prostate is this maroon line here. And we see prostate cancer is sort of puttering along uh, until uh, it, it sort of came up a little bit in terms of increased mortality. But since, uh, since around 1995, which is a few years after we started screening, we see this, this coming down, this mortality coming down. And it's steadily going down. This trend is continuing. So it's, it's really sort of in the modern era, say after you know, the 1970s, it's, it's started to fall. And, and this is real. Uh, we also see other cohorts, not just across the United States, we, we, in, in SEER, which is the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results uh, database from the National Cancer Institute. We see it in, uh, in epidemiologic data from Olmsted County, which is a very famous uh, um, uh, surveillance, a very famous cohort study. Um, we see it in Canada, another nation that, that screens with, with uh, PSA. Uh, we see it in the Department of Defense, so, so patients who are, who are in that healthcare system. And we see it in, in Austria, in, in, the, in the Tyrol area, uh, which screens. We haven't seen mortality fall in areas where PSA screening is not, uh, is not done, like Mexico. Um, so this is, this is pretty good circumstantial evidence for, for the benefit. Um, Uh, mortality is is death, but uh, and and what we're looking at specifically is death from uh, this is prostate cancer specific mortality, um, but the simple answer is is death. So men men with prostate cancer are are dying less in an age adjusted way. So they're living they're living longer. They're not dying of prostate cancer, even though they're diagnosed with it. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably because we, in 1930, they didn't have, they weren't able to make diagnosis as well. People were dying of bone cancer. A lot of people who, who had bone cancer actually had prostate cancer. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I think that would explain a, a lot of the, a lot of the difference from, from way back when. But you know, you certainly could argue that part of it is the change in diet uh, and all of you know the epidemiologic factors that, that people think are are uh, are at play in terms of making prostate cancer uh, you know as prevalent as it is. But it, it's a good observation. I would imagine most of it has to do with that, with with, with the reporting and and uh, and our ability to to detect it. So. In order to answer the question, does PSA screening actually improve mortality, uh, there were two huge screening trials that were undertaken. One in the United States uh, called the, the PLCO, the Prostate, Lung, Colon, and Ovary Study, uh, and a one in Europe called the ERSPC, the European Randomized uh, Study of Screening for Prostate Cancer. These were huge studies, multi-million dollar studies. Um, the PLCO in the United States enrolled almost 80,000 patients who were randomized to screening or control. Uh, in Europe, it was 180,000. It was huge, a multi-national multi study in Europe. Uh, they, they had slightly different screening protocols. And, and in the end, we'll talk about they had slightly different results. Um, but in the United States, uh, patients were randomized either to regular treatment, whatever they'd get in their community, or they would get uh, a protocol of annual PSA, digital rectal exam, and then uh, referral to biopsy when their PSA hit four. 
um, they were followed for uh, for six years, and 85% of the cohort, at the time that, that they reported the results, 85% uh, of the cohort had gone through six years of the study. Uh, in Europe, they were getting PSAs every four years. Now, in Europe, PSA screening was not as common as it is in the United States. They weren't getting DREs, and they had various PSA cutoffs depending upon the countries where they were, but it was essentially between three and four. Um, the control protocol was was not really uh, described at all either, and that, that was that was a difference. Um, uh, the completed follow-up was seven years. Men with cancer were followed longer, or were followed shorter, because once they're once they're diagnosed, um, uh, uh, they they weren't followed as long. Me the, but the median follow-up was eleven years, uh, and it was nine in in Europe, both for the control and screening arm. So if you look at the United States study. What they found, these are, these are the cumulative number of cases, so this is, this is overall number of cases. They found that in the screening arm, more cases were diagnosed than in the control arm. And that makes sense uh, because when you're doing more, more aggressive intervention, to, you're doing PSAs, you're, you're following men specifically for prostate cancer, you're going to find more cases. The disappointing result uh, in the United States uh, uh, study was that there seemed to be more deaths in the screening arm than in the control arm, or, or statistically speaking, there was no difference in the number of deaths between the two arms. So ultimately, there was a 22% increase in detection of prostate cancer, but no change in mortality at seven years. And again, seven years is a little bit of a short time, but the impact of screening, they concluded, was essentially overdiagnosis. Uh, and uh, and treatment remained a topic of, of active investigation. They're not sure what what the what the true outcomes of that of that was. There's a lot of criticisms of of this study, and, and I think these are extremely valid. Uh, and and I'll try to summarize this all at the end. So if you're not following every nuance of what I'm saying here, don't worry. Uh, I'll try to tie it all together at the end. But in the United States, 40% of the people who were enrolled into the study had had at least one PSA. There's a lot of data out there that one PSA can be incredibly predictive, especially in longitudinal studies. Um, uh, some, some groups recommend a single PSA at age 40 to risk stratify and then determine uh, screening protocols afterwards. But a lot of the patients who had already been pre-screened, and presumably if their PSA had been terrible, they would have been treated or they would have been, you, you essentially take out the most severe cases by only allowing, by, by allowing such a pre-screened population to make it into the study. There's also uh, what they call contamination. When you randomize people to community uh, care in the United States, that includes a lot of PSA screening. So half of the men in the control arm were essentially treated as if they were part of the intervention arm. They were getting routine PSAs. So, so that is gonna, that's going to uh, blunt whatever effective PSA screening there was. So that, that's going to blunt the difference in the outcomes between the two groups. Um, there's also some, some reports of delayed biopsy in terms of men who, who were having positive PSAs because of uh, administrative burdens and whatnot uh, or, or patient choice. Uh, there, it was taking a long time between, um, between an abnormal PSA and actually reaching the urologist for a biopsy. It's usually not 12 months, uh, but, but it was taking a long time in this particular study. Again, the seven-year window is very, very short for prostate cancer. Uh, in general, you know, some numbers that, that I like to quote are that if you're diagnosed with PSA screening with a tumor, if you have a T1C cancer, all comers, and you decide that you don't want to be treated at all and you're going to go live on a mountain and, and just, you know, uh, not worry about anything at all, it would be about 15 years before the prostate cancer would kill you. So it would take a long time, uh, longer than seven years, to really demonstrate the benefit of early treatment. Uh, and, and some people argued that there was an outdated selection criteria of a PSA cutoff of four. That's controversial, but some groups definitely biopsy at PSA 2.5 as a, as, a, as a routine. The European study was, was, uh, was very different, again, in, in a not pre-screened population. The European study demonstrated, this is, this is the cumulative incidence, that the control group had more 
uh, prostate cancer uh, deaths than in the screening group. So it demonstrated a benefit. Again, these are side by side where, where here there's no statistical difference. Here is the benefit in the European study. The, these curves are significantly separated. Some people ask, it, is it a problem that the curves meet at the end? Uh, and it doesn't because if you wait long enough, everybody will die and the curves will, will be completely together at the end. The difference is, the importance is, uh, is the separation between these two curves and that was significant. So they concluded that PSA screening decreased the number of deaths from prostate cancer. They saw a 20% mortality, in, especially in, uh, in the age group of 55 to 69. Uh, and in terms of the numbers needed to prevent one prostate cancer death, you have to screen about 1,000 men, treat 48 men, uh, and that prevents one prostate cancer death. So it's on the expensive side early on. There's some data that as this data, uh, there's, some, there's some suggestion that as this data matures, these numbers are improving, meaning fewer men needed to screen, fewer men needed to treat to save, to save a death, but, but still relatively large numbers. Uh, significant risk of overdiagnosis, uh, unnecessary treatment, and, and treatment-related morbidity. Uh, they couldn't really comment on the optimal initiation of screening or, or the optimal screening interval. The criticisms of this study was that the control group was not controlled. Or did they even have any access to medical care? It wasn't clear. It was a conglomeration of different countries and criteria and randomization schemes and treatment strategies. It makes it a little bit difficult to, to uh, make very firm conclusions from some of the things that happened. Um, again, this is also an interim analysis with a limited number of events. As this cohort continues to get followed, we'll get better and better data. Uh, and, uh, and treatment wasn't standardized for those in either group after diagnosis. So it's possible that you could have been diagnosed with prostate cancer but then not gone on to receive treatment. So that would, uh, that would, uh, that would again sort of um, tend to erase the difference between the two groups. So maybe the, the treatment benefit would be even bigger. So in my opinion, uh, based on what we have now, neither of these trials has sufficient follow-up to make definitive recommendations. We, we only have the very beginnings of, of trends for things. But neither of these trials really was properly designed to answer the question, does use of PSA to screen for prostate cancer save lives or not, versus not screening? What the question really was in the two countries, because both of them used regular care as the control is what's the incremental benefit of formalized extension of PSA screening. So in the United States, perhaps, you know, with this 50% screening rate that everyone's going about, perhaps yearly screening doesn't really add that much. Maybe all you need in, in your life is, you know, 5, 10 PSAs or, or, or a few PSAs, and, and that's enough to really to, to demonstrate a benefit. We, we don't know, but it's possible. Uh, and perhaps in Europe, it's better to get a PSA every four years rather than, rather than not getting a PSA at all. So it's, it's, I, I really think of these, of these studies as, as the incremental benefit of, of these programs. And uh, perhaps the, the answer lies in somewhere maybe more frequently than, than every four years, maybe less frequently than every year. But, but this, is just, this is just my opinion. The data doesn't support one thing or another. It's just something to think about. But, but I personally believe that there is benefit to, to screening. If you're confused, uh, so are your physicians. Certainly your primary care docs may be confused about this. Uh, many urologists are. Uh, uh, it, it's hard to know what to do with it. Uh, and it becomes a very, you know, personal, uh, personal choice for, for patients. Um, I'm going to skip over this section on other biomarkers because I don't, Why would yeah. You do that? Why would you skip over that's, like, that's the... I'm just kind of running towards the end of my time and I'd really like the message of, of, of the, the good parts and the bad parts of PSA to stick. Uh, I, I could talk about it. I, I, I um, I, I'm going to skip over, but if you'd like to chat about it afterwards, I'm, I'm happy to discuss with, with you. Uh, the, 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 bo the bottom line is the only other approved, FDA approved test for PSA is, uh, for, for prostate cancer screening is free PSA. 
Uh, it initially had really good results, and now it seems to be not as good for a variety of reasons. Um, because the, 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 the substance itself is not necessarily all that stable. Uh, it seems to vary a lot with the age and size of the prostate. So free PSA, while people had a lot of excitement and enthusiasm for it, it sort of waned. Uh, there's another marker that's undergoing tests to be approved by FDA. That's called PCA3. It's a urine test. It seems to be pretty good at telling whether you have cancer, yes or no, but not whether you have aggressive cancer. And the problems with a lot of the studies that were done in PCA3 is that they always build on a population which has already been screened with PSA. So having PSA around muddles all of these studies because you're not going to find a group of men somewhere who haven't had PSA screening. You're not going to find controls and you're not going to find prostate cancer cases where PSA wasn't a part of their care. But uh, the FDA is actually, um, initially they had thought that, uh, that this summer they were going to come out with a, with a recommendation for, for PCA3, uh, and now they've asked for more time, and they're looking at early 2012 uh, to, make, to make the decision about that. But that'll be very exciting if that comes out. There's, there are reference labs in the United States that run the PCA3 assay. Uh, it's just not widely available. So that was my quick spiel. So uh, the question is, how should we screen for prostate cancer? There's a number of professional societies that have a number of guidelines, and they are wildly disparate. Uh, you have um, you know, the United States Pre Preventative Services Task Force, which says absolutely no screening in men over the age of 75, and insufficient evidence for any recommendation for men under 75. And it runs the gamut all the way to uh, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which says that uh, every man should have a baseline PSA done at 40 in order to risk stratify them into an aggressive or less aggressive screening uh, protocol. Um, the American Cancer Society talks about informed discussion of risks and benefits. And uh, to start this in the, in, at age 40 for uh, uh, high-risk patients uh, like African Americans or, or men with family history of prostate cancer uh, or in their 50s for, for men with average risk, um, the, P, the AUA recommends screening well-informed men uh, with, with a baseline measurement at age 40. But as you can tell, it's kind of all over the map, and it's very highly political whenever, uh, whenever changes to the recommendations are made. There's many unanswered questions, so it's, it's difficult to say which is the best uh, screening regimen. We, we, don't, we don't know what the optimal timing is. We don't know when it should be initiated. We don't know whether it should be tailored to screen, uh, to, to screen different risks. Uh, we don't know for whom treatment is effective necessarily. We know it seems to be in younger men, uh, but actually now there, there's some data that's coming out uh, that it appears that we do better with surgery and treatment of higher risk prostate cancers that, than we thought. We used to think that, that we really couldn't cure or, or uh, you know, we were, we were not going to make a big difference with Gleason 9s and 10s, but it seems that, that, that we make a huge difference there, and, and we, didn't, we didn't know that. Um, you know, are there better biomarkers than PSA? People are working on that. What's the cost effectiveness of PSA screening? We don't know this. But uh, my beliefs about PSA screening is, is that PSA screening is effective and it save li saves lives in a population level. I think the circumstantial evidence uh, uh, in terms of the fall in mortality in prostate cancer is very compelling. Uh, I think the data from Europe are very compelling. And to me, it makes sense why the United States study wasn't going to demonstrate a difference. I think if, if we had thought about it you know, long and hard before they initiated the study, we would probably think that it wouldn't make, uh, it wouldn't make a difference in the United States the way that it was set up. Uh, we can't really, uh, we know that PSA screening, in spite of my belief that, that it works, we know that it also leads to overdiagnosis and overtreatment on a population level. Many more men are getting treated uh, for prostate cancer than, than need it. The real problem and the crux of the problem for the last, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years, is that we can't determine who's going to benefit or who's going to be harmed through PSA screening or, or, or treatment. Um, so what, what this really does is it places the, the onus on, on the patient. 
uh, uh, each man has to have the discussion with, uh, with his physician and probably with his family and do a lot of thinking and determine what's, what's most important to him. Um, research into other biomarkers currently is ongoing. It'd be great. Everybody, you know, sort of answers, everybody ends their talk with, you know, the answer is the next biomarker. Uh, um, and that could be true. Uh, and there is research under ongoing, but it's not ready for prime time. Uh, but, you know, what we have now is, is, is PSA, uh, um, which, you know, I, again, uh, uh, it's not a four-letter word like, uh, like sometimes it's portrayed to be. It's not perfect, but it's probably the best biomarker that we have in cancer. Um, and, but we have, to be very, um, we have to be very thoughtful about how we use it. And, and as a patient, I think you have to be very uh, thoughtful about how much risk you can tolerate, uh, uh, what, uh, what your preferences are for side effects of treatment, things like that, and, and make a very thoughtful, informed decision, which is not an easy decision about whether to be screened or not. So that's all I've got. Thank you.